Hey kids, welcome back. It's day one, week three. Today's reflection question is, if you discovered a deserted island where you could create your own civilization, what would be the first rule you create? Hmm, remember, be thoughtful, two to three complete and wonderfully thoughtful sentences, and we'll see you at day two. Bye! Stick! Charlie, come on. Oh, got my uh, track spikes on. It's uh, Spirit Week. One of the days this week is Sports Week. And since uh, I don't video every single day, I thought I was going to rep on uh, Sports Week. I've got a couple of activities. One was this great uh, 4x100 with Charlie, uh, Willie the Whale, and uh, Courage the, cu- uh, the, the Cougar. But Charlie messed it up, uh, you know. Come on, you you didn't even get the other two in here, but that's all right. Um, Another one's uh, gonna be later. I'll show you what I've got in store for us. All right, don't forget after uh, you listen to our read aloud, read for 20 minutes on your own, uh, and then go and answer Rex's reflection question in Schoology, and uh, check out today's um, uh, assignment, and I'll get to that in a little bit. All right, I've got six agenda items uh, today. One, uh, reading quiz, uh, two, uh, do all of your assignments. I've got a lot of inconsistent work. I'll talk a little bit about that, what that looks like and grading moving forward. Three videos. These videos, your current, this video, Mr. Irma's daily video, the two each week. Talk a little bit about what uh, my expectation is moving forward. Uh, four, um, this week is an assessment week. Uh, so the directions are in today's uh, article, day one's uh, article. And so I'll get to that in a bit. Five, we'll have our very first show and tell. We got about 11 students sharing. Uh, I, I love that. And then six, I'm going to talk about Spirit Week and what you could do uh, for that. All right, one reading quizzes. Just a reminder, uh, you only have to do five of seven of them. Remember, the link in our distance learning folder is live. You don't need a monitor passcode any longer. So go and do those at your own leisure. I will be. Uh, going and checking you individually at the end of the the school year and making sure you've read five uh, books for trimester three. If you don't find a reading quiz, that's okay. Just send me an email or a a Schoology message saying you you can't find a quiz. I'll give you the instructions individually on that then. Uh, The second one is do all your assignments. I have about 50% of student completion work. I did ran the numbers. It's really 52%. Um, But just make sure you are doing the work I have uh, in our distance learning folder. It's broken down by week. So if you know you had a slow start those first couple of weeks, don't fall behind. Go back and do them. Uh, I don't think it's hard. There's a it's there. You found that we're establishing a routine. Watch the video. See what Mr. Ermer's updates are. Listen to his read aloud. Read on my own, just like we do in class. And then at the end of that, we'll have our daily lesson. And so make sure you're falling into a, a routine with my class. Uh, the two days that we have it each week. Um, so. Um, make sure you are doing work and doing all of it because that is still an expectation. All right. Three, these videos do have instructions, so don't just turn them on, watch Rex's daily reflection, because I I find that people are doing the reflections and then missing some of my instructions that come later on. Um, So I do have instructions in here. I have updates that are important for everyone in class to hear. So please make sure you're watching my daily videos. Um, All right, Uh, update five or agenda item five are our show and tells. So let me delicately walk on my tile with my spikes because they will slip otherwise uh today all right we've got a show and tell i didn't quite crop them so i'm going to move them in a little bit closer for you once i get to them uh oh uh we've got people shared out for lauren s maddie max rogelio ella olivia nick perez has an update on his four-wheeler maddox ethan and noah thank you all for sharing content a bunch more of you submitted to that assignment just texting that's not the purpose of this it's not a graded assignment the show and tell assignment you'll see in every week's uh, folder is for you to upload pictures so as you're out in the community going on walks nature walks getting into projects i see a lot of people in my community um 
tiling or doing masonry work out in their front steps. As you get involved with your families and doing projects and you think it's cool and you want to share it with us, I'm going to have a daily slideshow. Um, and this is pretty fun. It's been fun seeing what you're all up to. So here's today's uh, show and tell. Here's a picture of Lauren S. with her lovely dog. Uh, it's all cool. A lot of people are getting out of dogs. I saw an article uh, from California. There's a California dog adoption center that completely, they, it's unprecedented, but all of their dogs are gone. Everyone's adopting their dogs because they, people are out and walking a bunch in one company. Somebody's shared their trampoline pick. Awesome. I love trampolines. I used to be able to do some flips on there. And now I'm scared as heck of these things. I think Max shared this one. Um, he's just messing baseball. So he's like, you know what? I'm missing it's spring sports. Sports are currently all put on hold right now. And so I get that there's Kepler, uh, people playing video games. That's awesome. I love it. I like video games. I've been playing some super Nintendo old school kitty, kitty, kitty dogs are better than kitty. Sorry. Somebody's doing flips. Who is this? I'm up. And I don't remember who this was. I'm up to jumping on my trampoline and learning new skills because it's a way I can get outside, but also stay away from people because it's needed. So it is my space and no one else can come in. That's awesome. I appreciate that. Um, that, that is cool. Uh, I like this. If you could submit it like this where you have your own little caption, I'll read them. I think that's kind of where I'm envisioning it. That four-wheeler from last week is all fixed and up and running. Good job, Nick Perez. That's cool. We got a little Ethan's got a uh, pet rat he's been playing with. That's cute. I used to have a pet rat as well. Uh, Maddox updated. He says, hi, this is Maddox. Just doing my homework. Then I spend the rest of my day playing video games, but mainly I get outside. Cool. Yeah, don't spend too much time on the video games. It's cool. I like video games too, but I get outside um, uh, too. We got video games. People are playing their video games though. All right. That's your show and tell. Please continue to submit uh, to those. I'll get that in a regular circulation. I think that's fun. I think we'll see ideas. It's fun to connect with each other. Everyone who's been contacting me has been telling me they miss everybody. Yeah, it's it's funny that you say, oh, I don't like school. School sucks. But you get to see all your friends at the very least. So people are missing those human connections. All right. Show and tell. This week's Spirit Week. Uh, Thursday, I think, is technically sports day. But oh, you know what? I don't really care because I don't see you every day. And I've got myself a trick shot. I play hockey, too. Uh, I'm going left hand on this. Uh, my trick shot is to go over Charlie's hand into my sinks uh, uh, across the way. So I've got a wiffle ball I'm using, not my hard puck, because I don't want to break anything in the kitchen. Here it goes. Oh, no, not this time. Hold on. Trick shot. Charlie denied me. I got to get over his hand, and I'm like two feet away, so it's pretty hard. Oh, got denied. I'm getting denied by my oven, not Charlie, actually. I'm going to get this. Anybody else got any cool trick shots you're doing at home? All right, here goes. That's going to happen. Woo! All right. One more time. I think I can get this. All right. That's not coming back, so I'll count that one as a win. All right. It's currently 56 degrees in the neighborhood. It smells good out there. And uh, get outside. It's going to be one to three inches tomorrow. I'm filming this on Saturday, so uh, it looks like it's going to get uh, a, bit, uh, a bit cold again. So that's welcome to April in Minnesota. All right. That's all I've got for you today. I'm going to continue our read aloud with chapter 14 of The Loser by Jerry Spinelli. To zinc off, there's not one darkness, but many. There is the dark in the closet and the dark under the bed and the dark he can never see. The dark inside a drawer. No matter how fast he opens a drawer, trying to catch the dark, the light pours in faster. There's the dark of outside and the dark of inside. Unlike most children, Zinkoff is not afraid of the dark. Outside darkness does not frighten him. His father has told him that the stars are faraway suns, and the thought of all those suns up there gives Zinkoff a warm and cozy feeling at night. Inside, 
he seems to carry his own sunshine with him. He's a sunshine bottle, even into the closet, where sometimes he hides from Polly without a twinge of fear. In one respect, however, he is like almost all children. He fears the darkness of the cellar. And even then, it isn't strictly the darkness that he fears. It's what dwells in the darkness. The furnace monster. Like most furnace monsters, Zinkoff stays out of sight behind the furnace when people are around. It's when the people leave, when the light goes off and the door at the top of the stairs closes in that purest darkness. That's when the monster comes out from behind the furnace. To be in the cellar then, this is the most terrifying thing Zinkoff can imagine. This will be his test. Perhaps if Zinkoff had not had two weeks to build up a good head of boredom, taking the test would not have occurred to him. But he is bored, and it does occur to him. And for Zinkoff, that is that. If it occurs to him, he does it. One day, while his mother is on the phone, and Paul is napping, he opens the door in the kitchen and stands at the head of the cellar stairs. He turns on the light. The cellar appears dimly below him, lit only by a bare 40-watt bulb. He counts the number of steps. How many do you think there are? There are nine. To his eyes, they look like 900. 900 steps into a bottomless black hole. Knees trembling, one sweaty hand on the railing, the other flat against the wall. He lowers himself one step. He's breathing fast. And if he's been running, as if he's been running, he sits down. He sits for a long time. He has thought that after a while he would begin to feel better, but he doesn't. He doesn't want to lower himself one more inch. He wants only one thing in this world, to turn around, take one step back up, turn out the light, re-enter the kitchen, close the door, and go curl up with Polly. He imagines himself doing exactly that and lowers himself down to the next step. More of the cellar comes into view, the cold, gray, cracked concrete floor, the once whitewashed walls, now gray and streaked with green slime, gashed in oozing sand, the coarse, time-worn planks of his father's workbench. The modern geometry of the oil furnace and water heaters seem out of place in this crumbling pit that reminds Zinkoff of ancient ruins. He lowers himself another step and thinks he glimpses the furry, edged, the furry edge of a flank pulling itself out of sight. He grips the front edge of the step with both hands. He stares bug-eyed into the shadows. The monster speaks. Zinka bolts back up the stairs and into the kitchen, into its glorious familiar light, the stitches in his stomach tingling. He knows it wasn't really the monster. It was really the oil furnace kicking on with a whoosh. He knows it. He knows it. Nevertheless, he doesn't go near the cellar door until the next day. The next day, he goes down three more steps. He is truly down into the cellar now, closer to the gray stone floor than to the top of the stairs. He looks back up at the light from the kitchen. He repeats to himself, it's only a cellar. It's only a cellar. His heart is banging to get out. His stitches tingle beyond the hum of the furnace. He can hear his mother's voice. She is on the phone a lot these days. She has gotten a job as a telemarketer. She sells memberships to a health club over the phone. He whispers in the direction of the furnace. Please don't come out. There is one other sound, the tock tock of his mother's cooking timer. He has set it at five minutes and brought it with him. It sits on the step beside him. It sounds like the thunder of a kettle drum. Bum, 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 bum. He has just decided the timer is broken when it goes off with a fire bell ring. He yelps back to the kitchen. On the third day, he leaves the timer behind. He lowers himself step by step until his feet rest on the cold cellar floor. He starts counting, whispering the numbers. He will stay until he reaches 100. 
It is noticeably cooler down here. Above him, a slurry of light barely leaks from the 40-watt bulb, mocking the sun and stars he loves. A smear of light puddles at the far corner of the furnace. At last, he reaches 100 and returns to the kitchen. He tries to feel good, to congratulate himself for what he has accomplished, but he cannot fool himself. He cannot forget that the test is not over. The next day, he returns to the doctor's office to get his stitches out. Then comes the weekend. He resumes the test on Monday. He does the same thing he did the first day. He lowers himself down three steps, only this time there's one difference. He does not turn on the light. This time, the only light reaching the cellar comes from the doorway at the top of the stairs. He begins counting how he wishes for the puny light from the 40-watt bulb. He holds up his hand. He stares at the backs of his fingers, anchors himself to the sight of them. He, his stitches are gone now, but the scar they left behind tingles on. By the time he reaches 100, the fingers he's staring at are shaking. He clambers up the stairs. Next day, down six steps, more than halfway, the hand before his face, less clear now. He finds himself counting too fast, makes himself slow down. It takes forever to reach 100. When he descends to the bottom step next day, the hand he holds up is pale and ghostly. It does not seem to be his. He forces himself to stare into the blackness before him he counts a new way the light is right behind me five the light is right behind me ten the light is right behind me fifteen some of the counts come out as burps he burps a lot since the operation by the end he's screaming the light is right behind me 100 as he flies up the stairs his mother comes running what happened nothing he says why were you screaming why were you breathing so hard? I am? Oh. She takes his chin in her hand and tilts his face upward. I think we'll both be glad when you go back to school. Back to the sofa. As usual, Zinkoff is first up next morning. He is so nervous, he's burping even more than usual. He can hardly get his breakfast down. Hard as the darkness test has been so far, the worst is yet to come. He waits for his father to leave for work. He waits for his mother to begin her telemarketing phone calls. He peers into the living room. The alarm is in her playpen, guarding the front door. The alarm, all caps. Who's the alarm? For a long time, he sits alone in the kitchen, feeling the light, soaking it up, imagining himself a light sponge. Never before has he so appreciated the mere sight of common things the silvery sides of the toaster yet, and its tiny pinched reflections, the plump blue and yellow Dutch boy cookie jar, the red straw sticking up from Polly's drinking cup. He takes one last look around. Will he ever see these things again? He pulls from his pocket the single sock that he has brought along. He bunches it into a ball and sticks it into his mouth. He sits some more. Wonder why he's putting that sock in his mouth. He ponders his plan. Three steps on the first day, three more on the second, down to the bottom on the third. At last, he pushes himself up from the chair and, like a condemned man, takes the long, doomed walk to the cellar door. He opens the door. He takes one step forward. He pulls the door shut behind him and, lean, and learns that his fear has missed the target. He was expecting darkness. Yes, really dark darkness, but this is something else. This is darkness so absolute, so wickedly pure that he himself seems to be, seems to have been wiped out. He holds his hand one inch before his face and cannot, positively cannot see his hand. He reaches for his 
opposite forearm, missing it on the first try to reassure himself that he is still there. He squeezes the forearm in hopes that some of the light he has sponged up will come squirting out. It does not. What a beautiful thought, though. So creative. He reaches behind for the door for its smooth painted surface. His trembling fingers find the doorknob. Turn it. A voice inside his ear whispers, turn it and go back. And that's what he tells his hand, turn it. But his hand is not listening. His hand is letting go. And now his whole body, contrary to all his wishes and good senses, lowering itself to a seat on the first step. And he learns a second thing. He can forget the three-day plan. He must do it all today. Now or never. He lowers himself one more step, seven to go, one more step, six to go, one more, one more. One. His silent scream probes for a weakness in the sock. One more, one more, and the monster is out from behind the furnace now. He knows it. He feels it. The monster is in front of the furnace and is moving toward the stairway. The monster is inches in front of his face now. He can touch it if he reaches out or takes one more step. The scar is singing. He doesn't think about it. He just does it. Two steps from the bottom. He turns and runs back up the stairs. In the dazzling light of the kitchen, he rips the sock from his mouth. He stands gasping over a chair. He thinks of the two steps he stopped short of. He has failed flunked his own test. He thinks about it for several moments. He hears his mother's voice on the phone. Upstairs, he listens. He heads off to play with Polly. Four days later, he goes back to school. Chapter 15 on day two. Ah, uh, these, uh, these track cleats are actually high jump uh, uh, cleats. They have spikes on the bo the back, on the heel, too. Usually uh, 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 sprinters or mid-distance and distance uh, spikes only have spikes on the, the front, but high jumpers have them on the heel, too, because you have to uh, do a turn and you have to jump while you are at a pretty steep angle. So you need to, uh, uh, to get grip on your heel, too. So thanks again. Uh, don't forget today's uh, assignment. Check out day one uh, today, day one and day two. It's a bit of an assessment. Yes, you can use your notes. Yes, you are at home. And no, I'm not monitoring you. But we're considering this is an assessment and it's summative. So check out the, the article, uh, the day one article. And we're going to be wrapping up this week with our Holocaust unit. Uh, you're going to be marking your test for signposts uh, today. And then day two, you're going to have a short multiple choice uh, quiz in Schoology. So stay tuned, have fun, send in those pics, pictures for show and tell. As a reminder, that show and tell assignment, it's not graded, but we want your pictures. Uh, and remember, you can't have uh, personal data information like addresses, phone numbers, or anything like that. Uh, so be careful with what you send, but everything that's been coming through so far is awesome. Go Woodbury track and field. Woo! See you on day two.